Hey, what do you know? It's the new current year. We've had hot takes about how awful last year was, backlashes against the hot takes, and backlashes against the backlashes. Standards are low and patience is lower. People are twisting themselves into contortions to prop up games and people that they hate for the sake of pragmatism. And the only common ground people have left seems to be the idea that this year will be better than the last one. Spoilers. But this disgust with the past isn't a recent thing, and it's not limited to last year alone. More and more people consider it a point of pride to not, quote, waste their time, end quote, with old things, ideas, media, etc. I think that's a flawed outlook on life. Now more than ever, it's important to look back to the past, not just to learn from it, but to gain some much needed perspective for the present. And I'm one of the best when it comes to reflecting upon the greatest video game genre of all time. Competitive platforming. But that field is too crowded so I cover fighting games instead. Fighting games like The Last Bronx. Initially released in arcades in 1996 on Sega's infamously expensive Model 2 board, Last Bronx, Tokyo Bandai was one of the earliest 3D weapons based fighting games ever made, trailing closely behind titles like Battle Arena Toshinden, Weapon Lord, and Soul Edge. That fact, coupled with its relatively low recognition nowadays, has earned Last Bronx its current reputation of being quote, underrated, end quote. What's somewhat less known is that it was successful in Japan, so much so that it had some spin off media like Radio Plays and Home Video. This was back in the 90s, when video games weren't always designed as multimedia projects from the start, so this is a fair measure of success. I wouldn't say that The Last Bronx is overrated or underrated. It's rated, and rated fairly. It had its day, and occupies its space in history. We can't call every game that falls out of the public eye underrated, or else virtually anything that doesn't get a sequel within three years or less would end up being a golden cow, my god, I think I just figured out sequel outrage. Those poor Mega Man fans. Those poor, poor Metroid fans. After all these years, I finally understand. Oh, uh, geez, where was I? Right, yes, so, <clears throat> at the time, The Last Bronx was thought up, dedicated weapons-based fighting was still a novelty. Characters with weapons were common, but those are based off of that one guy that always showed up in a fighting series. The one that uses their signature weapons so well that they're a serious threat. Making a game full of that guy was still uncharted territory, and Sega knew that. So they got to work on Last Bronx ASAP. Sega usually left traditional tournament fighting games to AM2, their main development team for arcade games. But at the time Last Bronx was thought up, AM2 was hard at work on Virtua Fighter 3. One, ready, go! So Last Bronx was developed by Sega's other amusement machine department team, AM3, which included developers who worked on games like Virtual Tennis, various racing games, and Virtual On, a series brave enough to state that input lag is bad, no matter how well you can account for it, and especially when it comes to controlling giant robots. Last Bronx's greatest strength was in its story and aesthetics, and that's what set it apart from its peers. So I'm doing it a disservice by not covering such things in depth, but they're just too subjective for me to make a clear comment for or against them. What I can note is how well they were received by players. Every generation of games reflects the spirit of the age it was made in, and Last Bronx is no different. The futuristic urban youth killing each other in the streets genre was as big as ever in Japan during the 90s, and Last Bronx absolutely nailed it. It's a good thing the actual game is solid too, or else this would be a short episode. The Last Bronx is AM3's first and last tournament fighter, and it's safe to say they drew a lot from the Virtual Fighter series. 
Last Bronx's controls are based on Virtua Fighter's punch, kick, guard setup. For those of you who don't know how that works, there's a punch button for punching, a kick button for kicking, and a guard button for guarding against attacks. Pressing different combinations of buttons, such as punch, kick, kick, guard, punch, guard, etc., essentially act as extra buttons or commands, just like how they worked in Virtua Fighter 2. The Last Bronx also doesn't follow an explicit attack triangle, where one type of attack or defense has a general advantage over another. Again, just like Virtua Fighter 2 did at the time, that didn't come in until later games in that series. Every character's move is highly personalized, throws are seemingly instant, and moves are very much punishable in most situations, so you have to play very carefully in order to do well in this game. The Last Bronx did, however, come up with its own mechanics in order to fit its needs, such as the combat role, performed by pressing all three buttons simultaneously, which dodges high and mid attacks, but is prone to low attacks. There's also guard cancelling, or G cancelling, which allows fighters to cancel an attack string and the animation for the cancelled attack by pressing guard. This essentially allows players to feint any move with minimal recovery, although the chain is stopped when the feint is performed. Obviously, command grabs and regular grabs are an exception to this. You get my point, though. Lots of games with guard buttons have a similar quirk, where pressing the guard button cuts off inputs for chains and allows you to buffer something else, but this is a formal mechanic that goes a bit farther. The Last Bronx also has unique versions of more common functions in fighting games. As mentioned before, some of the game's staff worked on Virtual On, and jumping is an important part of that series' fast-paced combat. So it's likely that they drew from prior experience when they made jumps so much faster and more fluid in The Last Bronx than they ever would be in Virtual Fighter 2. It's actually a, li a little sad to see how Last Bronx's jumps and pursuit attacks are much faster than Virtua Fighter 2's, especially since Virtua Fighter has never really loosened up in those aspects, even while the base gameplay started to speed up after Virtua Fighter 3 and 4. It's clearly not an issue of animation, as Last Bronx used the same motion capture technology as Virtua Fighter, and most of the same motion actors as well. As a side note, I'm starting to notice that stuntmen and animators alike seem to love wrestling moves. Wrestling holds and wild strikes that would be commonplace in wrestling games are pretty big moves in Last Bronx based on priority and damage and just overall presentation. A more recent example of this phenomenon would be how, allegedly, animators working on the King of Fighters 14 showed blatant favoritism towards Clark Robin Mask Steel's moves. Furthermore, stuntmen will use it as filler in Sunday morning action shows, and animators will use it as filler in comedy shows. It's pervasive. Maybe Japanese entertainment is powered by smarks. I don't know. Who knows? It's beyond me. Anyway, to compensate for the quick jumping, tracking is also very strong in this game. Characters have lots of time to shift axes within a move's animations, which really tamps down on the ability to jump over someone and punish a whiffed move. The catch is that attack chains will reduce this tracking, gradually turning you around to face your opponent with each strike. Last Bronx's roster is pretty small, even for its day. Contrary to popular belief, a roster of 8 fighters was only considered acceptable at the exact moment that Street Fighter II The World Warriors was released. One could even argue that it wasn't acceptable back then, since World Warriors had 12 fighters in total, but 4 of them were unplayable. However, the developers were willing to deal with a smaller roster in order to keep graphical standards high, and I suppose that was worth it in the long run. Animations are relatively smooth and easy to read, although the after-image effect hasn't really aged well. That said, AM3 focused more on the speed of the game than the quality of the character models and environments. The developers went out of their way to make sure it ran at 60 frames per second, not only for the arcade version, but for the Saturn and PC ports as well, which was very impressive for its day. Heck, running at 60 frames per second is impressive by today's standards, and probably will be for the near future.
In fact, when the game received home ports for the Windows PC and the Sega Saturn, Sega cut back on the visual quality of the models to make sure that it could continue to run the game at 60 frames per second. The director of both versions, Akinobu Abe, mentioned in an interview with Sega Saturn magazine that the team would have abandoned the Saturn port if they couldn't hit that 60 frames as a standard. AM3 as a group realized the importance of a solid frame rate early on and strived to maintain those qualities in their work, which is why Mars's development is such a mystery to this day. I'm comfortable saying that Last Bronx is a solid game. It's flawed, but it's as flawed today as it was on release, so I'd say it's aged well. AM3 did well enough, considering that they were lacking experience in straightforward fighting games. I'd also like to point out that Last Bronx is proof that AM3 is deadly serious about their lock-on jumping system in the Virtual On series. Last Bronx has normal, straightforward jumping. If they wanted to do the same for Virtual On, they easily could. They didn't put lock-on jumping in Last Bronx, they left that for Virtual On. So it's clear that they stick to the lock-on system because they want to, not because they have to. But the last Bronx was rushed, and I think people knew that even back then. And yet, it also seems like it didn't come out early enough to get some breathing room. About a month after it was released, Virtua Fighter 3 started running location tests, which stole Last Bronx's thunder. And while Last Bronx became Sega's third fighting game for a while, alongside Virtua Fighter 3 and Fighters Mega Mix, it never really had an opening to steal fans away from either of them. It's kind of funny, actually. Last Bronx was hurt by Virtua Fighter 3's hype, but another game got a foothold because of Virtua Fighter's development cycle. In the Valley of the Shadow of Virtua Fighter 3's release, a game called Goiken Muyo, Anarchy in the Nippon, made a home for itself and was protected from the criticism that would have normally dragged it down. VF3 had a couple of delays for its home port, which was initially promised for the Saturn, but eventually hit the Dreamcast as Virtua Fighter 3 TB, TB standing for Team Battle. And in that gap, a couple of developers who worked on Virtua Fighter 2 banded together and came up with another Urban Chaos fighting game. They pitched it to Sega, but Sega turned it down. However, an animation studio called KSS Incorporated approached them and offered to help them finish the game. KSS had some game development under their belt. They had worked for other companies on games like the Wrestle Angel series. But they were just starting to dip their toes into the deep end of video game publishing and development. So they snatched up these ex Virtua Fighter devs, drafted a bunch of well known Virtua Fighter players, and made the most Virtua Fighter game not called Virtua Fighter on the face of the planet. I might talk about that game some other time. In conclusion, I'd like to mention one more thing about The Last Bronx. It had a lot of stuff working against it in the competitive sphere of fighting games, but it is still mentioned in the upper echelons of Sega's arcade and Saturn games. It would be easy to say that people name drop it because obscurity has a certain type of appeal in the 2010s, when nothing is given credit for originality, and everything has clear inspiration from everything else. But I think it endures because its single-player content and the extraneous material made an impact on the people who gave it a shot. Initially, most of the plot was not covered in the game itself. Like most fighting games of its day, the stories of the various fighters were written into character bios and descriptions in manuals and, ca and cabinet notes. And even with those limitations, the game gained a following. Plus, when the game was ported to the Saturn and PC, Sega doubled down on the story mode, fleshing it out, and that went over well too. Now, If a fighting game can linger in the memories of its fans for this long, based on a hodgepodge of stories and single player content, then that single player content must have some meaning. It can't just be because people are that desperate for a story in a fighting game. And since Sega seems desperate to come up with something new to justify making Virtua Fighter 6, they might want to consider doing the same thing with that possible game that they did with The Last Bronx. Or maybe just consider making a sequel to The Last Bronx. Or Fighters Mega Mix 2. I think people would even take Eternal Champions 2 or Sonic the Fighters 2 at this point. 